Father, I have sinned. I have traded Team Green for Team Red, RTX 3080 for RX 6950 XT. I have owned several AMD CPUs over the past years, but I have never used an AMD graphics card in my jelly system. But when I saw a massive drop of price of RX 6950 XT, I decided to give Team Red a chance. Did I get disappointed? Was it worth the money and effort? Let us have a look. This is Seville Man. Please don't tell my wife, but I really didn't need a new graphics card. My RTX 3080 was doing its job just fine, but I like to tinker with my PC, so I couldn't resist the temptation. In my country, I could only get hold of the reference model or Sapphire Nitro for about the same price. Guess which one I picked. I use a relatively large case, so I don't mind the size of the graphics card too much, but boy, this one's huge. It's a triple slot design with three axial fans and it features three 8-pin connectors for some extra juice as its stack TDP reaches 335 watts. I'm not usually into rainbow puke effects, but I need to admit the RGB implementation on this card is impressive. RX 6950XT is a refresh of Navi 2 Top and Silicon. Yes, it pulls more power, but the RDNA 2 architecture is the same, so I don't expect miracles in terms of boost clocks. However, AMD bumped up the memory bandwidth by 11% to 18 gigabits per second, so VRAM heavy games may benefit from this increase. Without further ado, let us see how this Radeon Monster compares to RX 3070 as well as 3080 across a few synthetic benchmarks and games. I will also include ray tracing stats, even though RT isn't something AMD buyers usually care much about. What does matter though is available temporal upscaling or sharpening features such as NVIDIA DLSS, Intel XESS or MD FSR or RSR respectively. To set things straight, Quality-wise, you are almost always better off avoiding any upscaler whatsoever and sticking to the native rendering instead. However, as we can see in the benchmarks, this is not always a viable option, especially in 4K, where the native renderer produces very poor results, sometimes a slideshow. If owning an NVIDIA GPU, your second best option is GLSS. FSR comes next, and this one works on all GPUs that is AMD, NVIDIA or Intel provided the game implements this upscaling algorithm. The same applies to XCSS, but it usually provides less performance boost than FSR. It wouldn't be me unless I tried some overclocking. I read on forums the memory clock could be easily bumped by another 100 MHz with fast timings, but I apparently stumbled upon a potato sample in GDDR6 Silicon Larry. Therefore, no overclocking of VRAM this time. Let's see if GPU overclocking is the fool's errand as well. Here, I have mixed feelings. On one hand, I was able to make the card pull insane amount of power that is setting GPU PPT limit to 400 watts. But there was a catch. Or two. First, the race PPT limit introduced a terrible cold wine. Second, the GPU hotspot temperature hit the ceiling of 110 degrees centigrade and throttled. GPU hotspot is apparently the Achilles heel of Radeon cards. And it's a shame, because the GPU die is huge, which in theory should help with heat dissipation, but the delta between the average and the hotspot GPU temperature is way too high. Since I was not comfortable with this, I chose to go with undervolting instead. I use Hydra Utility to give me a hand, but I won't go into the details now, because I'm planning to make a separate video on what Hydra has to offer in terms of overclocking and undervolting of Radeon cards. Now, let's talk about the elephant in the room drivers. One reason enthusiasts hardly considered any AMD graphics card in the past was their poor stability. Black screens and driver crashes were the norm. Is this still the case today? 
AMD drivers have come a long way. I would even dare to say their software ecosystem is a lot more polished than Nvidia's offering. Have a look! AMD provides a one-stop shop inside their Adrenaline Edition app and that includes all sorts of options ranging from game optimization, screen recordings, performance overlays and so on. In contrast, Nvidia splits many of the same features in two applications, GeForce Experience and Control Panel. But why? Control Panel looks like a taskbar app left over from the 90s. It is clumsy and rather hard to navigate. Honestly, I've never used it except for turning G-Sync on and off and recently for enabling RTX VSR. That's literally it. The UI of GeForce Experience is acceptable, but why on earth does Nvidia force me to create a user account? For collecting personal data or what? I'm so not interested. It's a bummer because graphics drivers do not get updated automatically without running GeForce Experience and those supplied by Windows Update are woefully old. I can always go to Nvidia's website and download the latest game ready drivers manually, but can someone please tell me, why do I need to do this in the 21st century? On the other hand, AMD drivers get updated right from Adrenaline UI with a push of a button. And no, I don't need any account anywhere. Regarding black screens, I have not experienced any, not even one. And the overall stability of the graphics driver was excellent. I only encountered a crash when trying to overclock the GPU or VRAM, but that's an inevitable side effect of overclocking. But even when such mishap occurred, the driver recovered automatically. To be fair though, Adrenaline app did sometimes close unexpectedly. It was no big deal, as I could restart it once more, but it made me think twice whether to trust it for example with screen recording. Am I keeping the card? Sure, I do, because like I said, I enjoy tinkering with the new hardware and I can still keep RTX 3080 in my other PC. The RTX 3070 found its new home in my brother's PC with Ryzen 5 5600G, which I built for him earlier in one of my previous videos, and I'm sure it will serve him well. Thanks for watching and have a nice one.